Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you doing? It's quite the exhausting but fun weekend last weekend, huh? We have another uh, day where we can celebrate the Lord this morning. Re renew our energy and strength in the Lord this morning by worshiping Him. Why don't you stand up and worship God together? It's a happy day in the house of our Lord. Amen. Yes, good to be back, isn't it?
Hallelujah. We worship, we praise you, Lord God. For your wonderful and merciful God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
I just ask that you just continue to move across this place this morning, Lord Jesus, because it is all about you, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you'd help us to just lay everything down at your feet this morning, Lord God, and to just worship you, Lord. Not to worry about the things that have gone on in our lives this week or what someone did or said, but Father, I pray that we would just come to you and lay everything down at your feet and worship you because it is all about you, Jesus. We magnify your precious name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you. Glory to your name, Jesus.
Pastor is going to do communion this morning. Thank you. Get that out of here. That's a good one. That's a good one. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Look at somebody say, Praise the Lord. Now do it in the Pentecostal way. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, Brother John Rosenstern, if you're watching this morning by any chance, we love you. You were a blessing last week, and uh, we really appreciate you. We will, Lord willing, have you back. Jesus Terry. Hallelujah. Glory to God. As they pass out the communion wafers this morning, you need to examine your heart. You need to ask yourself, is there anything unclean in me, Lord, that you need to speak to me about, that I need to repent of? God warns us not to take communion unworthily, but to examine our hearts. And we don't put our trust in anything else. We don't put our trust in the church. We don't put it in tithing. We don't put it in taking communion. We put it in Jesus Christ who died on the cross and what he accomplished. That's what we put our faith and our trust in when we receive communion. So let the Lord speak to you as they're passing these out. Hallelujah. Jesus. As we come before the Lord this morning, I'm going to ask you to just hold your wafer up. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 24 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's break the bread, partake. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. We remember that it is you that suffered for us, for our sins, Lord. 
and that by Jesus stripes we also were healed physically and spiritually and we praise you for that father we thank you for it in Jesus name let's all take the grape juice verse 25 goes on after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the lord's death till he come let's all partake praise the lord glory to god thank you jesus thank you for being obedient and going to the cross and shedding your precious blood for us. We thank you for that, Lord. And we remember you. It's all about you, Lord. It's not about us. It's about what you did on the cross. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, if you're able to stand, let's just greet one another before we start the rest of the service. And Miss Abby comes up to do announcements. joining us on Facebook Live. Um, just a reminder to please silence your cell phones so that you don't distract others during the service. And if you have a prayer request, please fill out a card in the prayer box in the foyer below or submit a request at, to, pre, hmm, to prayer at cfassembly.com. All requests are prayed for each week. You can join us for prayer each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. in the Lodge or 6 p.m. online via Zoom. Men's Bible study meets Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. at the church, and Ignite meets this Wednesday, May 8th at 6 p.m. See Sandra with any questions. Um, the next men's breakfast is Saturday, May 11th at 9 a.m. Um, you can see Doug or Pastor with any questions. You can join us today after the service for a fellowship hour over a cup of coffee and cookies. Um, VBS is just around the corner, and it will be... Yeah. Um, it will be held July 22nd through July 28th. Online registration is open, and you can go to www.cfassembly.com um, and click the children's tab, or you can grab a paper outside the sanctuary and fill that out as well. Um, I think Bonnie has an announcement, too. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. We 
had such an exciting silent auction. Hey, ladies, we raised a thousand dollars for BBS. But I'm not done. I have one more auction. It's a one night stay, King Suite, Whirlpool Tub, at America Inn right up the road. So I have got um, silent, or auction sheets out on the table in front of the sanctuary. I want you to bid on them. And then next Sunday, before service or during the announcement, we'll announce who won that great. And Mother's Day is coming up, you guys. Yeah. 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 And also, I want to mention that um, when the newsletter went, came out uh, for the May Bulletin, it mentioned that we're going to have a bake sale on the 18th. That is not happening. We've been just too much going on right now, so we're going to put it on hold, and uh, we'll let Amy know when so she can put it on the bulletin. But thank you all for all your contributions. That was great. Okay, so for offering, you can feel free to give up up front right here. Or we also have online giving available at our website under the Give Now tab. I'll pray now. Dear Lord, thank you for everyone being here and those watching online. And I pray that you'll bless this offering and everyone that's giving today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's a jungle out there. Every day, our kids encounter questions about their faith. Did God create everything? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I really trust the Bible? At the Great Jungle Journey, kids will explore the answers to these questions and more as they embark on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. As your children sail along on a fun jungle cruise, they'll stop at seven ports of call, the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. Kids will discover how these events shape our world, and they will realize their need for a savior as they reconnect the Bible to their everyday lives. Prepare to swing into fun on the Great Jungle Journey. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I guess there's no Sunday school this morning, right? Okay, praise the Lord. Not that there's no Sunday school. I'm just saying praise the Lord. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to have children in here anyway because that's, uh, they need to learn and hear and know what it's like to be in with the adults too. Amen? Yes. I don't like it when we separate all the time. I think that's not the way God meant it. But uh, together, we got somebody got a question here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyway, today, uh, I just want to announce again, because this is important, one of the most important mission things that we support at Crossfire Assembly, this church, again, purchased this week 10 more cases of Bibles to go around the world. Yeah. So we, we've given, I've figured out with what we've done so far, we've well given over 1,000 Bibles this church has in the last six months around the world and we're going to with the lord's help continue as you're faithful with your tithe and offerings we can do that one thing that i encourage people don't be afraid to give if you're watching by facebook today don't be afraid to give to crossfire assembly we do not keep the money for administration we do not keep the money for buying me a new pickup truck it all goes into bibles amen it all goes into Bibles. It goes into missions. We still support all our other missionaries, which are vitally important also. I really like the Bible one because that makes you missionaries also out there. Every time we send the Bible out, your dollars that you've given back to the Lord, that is his, goes out to reach lost souls. So thank you very much for doing that. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do through all these Bibles throughout this world. Amen. And uh, kind of segue into that, my message today is uh, the sinfulness of sin. 
Any groans? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we're in a spiritual warfare, people. This world is in a spiritual warfare, and I know that there's churches that like to preach, again, messages that make people feel good and happy and uh, upbeat, but that only lasts for a little bit because as the world gets darker and darker, we need something to hold on to. We need the Word of God to help us to know that He is in control. He's on the throne, and the truth has got to be preached, and this can be for young and old, and I'm going to ask people today, too, if you can, stay in the sanctuary here, and if, you're, uh, if you don't have to go out, please don't. It brings distraction, because the Holy Spirit moves on hearts and lives, and when there's constant action, it distracts away from the Word, amen? amen? I ask that respectfully and politely. And if there is anybody uh, meandering around out there, we can have our safety crew direct you back to show you where the sanctuary is. But uh, just, you know, I understand things happen too, but I just would appreciate that because these are important messages. Uh, and I believe that the Lord is coming soon. I believe he's preparing his church. We're watching things happen. They're speeding up. Yeah, even as our brother John preached last week, what's happening in Israel, that's our time clock. That's what we are watching right now, what God is doing there. As we see things come together there, things are happening worldwide. And one of the things that I felt strongly to preach on is he preached on the new and old covenant also, as we've got to preach on sin again. Sin has gotten lost, and it's still real. That's what's destroying our nation. That's what's destroying our homes today is sin, but we're afraid to offend anybody, so we don't want to preach on that. We want to just preach on good things. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to preach on a good thing today. It's called sin and the respect that I'm going to warn you about it because if you and I are aware of sin in our own personal life, guess what? God is going to fix those things in your life. Amen. Then you'll be happy. Then you'll be blessed. You want to know how to be happy and blessed? Continually obey the Word of God. Amen. 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 That's where it starts. But why preachers want to stay away from these issues is beyond me because they don't realize they're taking away the blessings that God wants to put up on you and I. And God put these as road signs to you and I so that we could avoid these things in life. So I'm going to preach on that with boldness today. I'm not going to turn away from it. I'm not here to be popular, as I usually tell you. That doesn't mean anything to me. I'm going to give you the word of God the best as I can of my ability and pray that the Holy Spirit will do a work in my life as I prepare them and in your life as I give it out. So we want to thank the Lord for being here today with us, don't we? Look at somebody and say, I'm glad Jesus is here this morning. I'm glad Jesus is here this morning. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you this morning. You're here. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, you're here in the midst. And you're here this morning, Lord. And I praise you and I thank you and I glorify you for everything that we do within this body, this church body especially, we do for your glory. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. I pray today, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit that you would open our spiritual ears to receive and our spiritual eyes to be able to see what is happening in our world and why we're under such terrible things going on in our nation today and in the world. And I pray, Father, that your word will bring a challenge to us, conviction, not condemnation, but a conviction into our hearts that if there's an area that you want to do work in us, to clean us, to sanctify us, to set us apart for your glory in this hour that we live, Father, let the Holy Spirit speak to us through your written word. And your word is an anointed word. Anoint this congregation and, and your word as it goes forth, Father, to do the work that you've called it to do. It will not return void, but it will work in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. So the sinfulness of sin. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Would you agree with that? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Well, the wounds from a friend, are, they can be cutting and sharp sometimes, can't they? They can make you feel bad or whatever, but the friend said it in a purpose to help you. And it's better than to have kisses of a treacherous, treacherous, deceptive, crafty enemy that tells you everything is okay. 
Somebody pats you on the head when they know you're not where you belong with God and they're patting you on the head. Oh, you're okay. No, that's an enemy. That's not somebody who loves you. You're only okay when you come to Jesus Christ and repent of whatever sin that you and I are living in. That's when you're okay. And it takes a true friend to be willing to stand that, even at the risk of you being angry at them and turning from them. They are willing to tell you the truth because they know eternity is coming sooner than we think. And that's why a true friend is somebody who will walk up to you and tell you something that is truthful to help you not to hurt you, even though you may be hurt because they were willing to tell you. But I don't like people who come up to me and just give me uh, flatterings just to impress me and say, you're okay. No, I'm not okay if I'm not where I belong with Jesus. And that's not your friend. That's an enemy. Many pastors stand behind pulpits throughout this nation today, and they're not willing to preach on sin, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and tell the congregation that eternity is coming. Hell is real and heaven is real. They're not willing to do that because they do not want to offend anyone. Well, I'll tell you what, they got the problem, and I would be willing to tell them that, that we've got to preach the whole counsel of God the best we can because we are in serious times, and God has got a timetable, and he is coming back. Amen. He is coming back. Jesus is coming. Are you excited? Yes. Oh, good. I, I thought nobody was excited but me here today. So, But I, I don't care. Again, if you're younger, older in here, you need to hear this. You need to listen, even if you don't understand it all. You need to hear about what sin is going to do in your and my life. So on a sunny September day in Chicago, a stern face, and, and by the way, that isn't me. A stern-faced, plainly-dressed man could be seen standing still on a street corner in a busy loop. As people were hurrying on their way to lunch or business, he would solemnly lift his right arm and point to the person nearest him and loudly say a single word, Guilty! He would do this without any change of expression, then resume his stiff stance for a short period of time and repeat the process again. Over and over, he would raise his right arm, point to a person, and pronounce them, Guilty! A person present described the reactions of the pedestrians as almost eerie. It was as if they didn't quite know how to respond to this man. One man perhaps described how many others probably felt, turned to another person and explained, but how did he know? But how did he know? Whatever became of sin. There's a satanic attack upon this world right now. They're coming after Christians. They want to stop the gospel from going forth. The devil does. And he's working through hearts that are willing to receive and accept it. And we need to be aware of that right now. We need to speak the truth and love to a lost and dying world as well as to one another. Amen? Amen. Where is sin gone? Well, it's not that sin has disappeared or that we no longer feel guilty. In fact, most people could respond just like the pastor, but, but how did he know? You know how many times that I've been a pastor here now for 12 years doing this? How many times I've had people come up to me after, sir, you were talking right to me. How did you know? I didn't know anything. I'm just preaching the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit. If you feel uh, guilty, if you feel upset about something, don't attack me, the messenger. I'm only preaching this. Amen? Amen. Because God knows. See, he knows, again, how to read our email. He knows how to do that. And if this message is affecting you and you're upset about it, you are upset. I had a guy approach me one time after a year had gone by and he walked up or he called me on the phone actually. And he said, I hated you. I said, why did you hate me? He said, because you were telling the truth and I wasn't living where I was supposed to. And every time I come there, you were preaching on sin or something like this in the scripture, and it bothered me. It bothered me so bad, I had to get up and leave, and I said, I'll never go back there again. But he called me up after a year, and he asked me to forgive him for his hatred toward me. 
He said, the reason I hated you wasn't really you. I hated what you were talking about because I was living in sin. But you, there's a risk when you speak for Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> when, you, when you tell people the truth, there's going to be a risk, and we need to remember that. Most people do, do have a sense of their own guilt. We do have that. They feel guilty not because someone tells them they're guilty, because they truly are guilty. Romans chapter 2, verse 15, if you have your Bibles too, you can follow me. I I, I'm, I'm going to try to get through this quickly and everything, but if you do have it, feel free to write them down, or you can go back and play this too. Which show the work of the law, Romans 2, 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while well, accusing or else excusing one another. And you can't even rely on your conscience sometimes because Scripture teaches us that our conscience can be seared. So we can't even rely on our own conscience sometimes. We need to rely upon the Word of God. Yeah. What's God say? Not some psychologist, psychologist, theology person, preacher, missionary, any of you. we got to depend on this. This is the truth right here. And we need to be aware of that. We're guilty because we have sinned. We're guilty because we've sinned. Guilt is a warning that tells us we have violated the moral code. If you feel guilty of something in your life that you're doing, practicing, thinking, or whatever, that guilt is coming from the Holy Spirit. That's conviction. We're all guilty. Jesus in this Sermon on the Mount has been pointing out that not only is the sinful deed wrong, but also the, sin, the sinful desire. If you have sinful desires, as is wrong. So it should be clear that we have all failed to meet that standard, haven't we? Every one of us. Sin, however, is largely ignored as a moral evil in our day. We do not like to use the term, anything goes, what we do, what we look at, what we listen to, how we speak, TV, internet, whatever it is, anything goes today in our society now. We don't want to call it sin. We don't want to call it anything like that. But anything goes. We downplay sin. We say that we have faults, shortcomings, hang-ups, problems, mistakes, slip-ups, or that we are dysfunctional or sick. We're just human. There's all things that we want to say, but we don't want to call it sin. We don't want to do that. We simply don't like to use the word sin in this world that we're living today. We don't want to be a sinner. Why do you think God's under attack? Why are we trying to shut God out of our government, out of our schools, out of our homes, out of everything in our life? Because they don't like the idea. One thing that comes to my mind is that sin has a religious overtone. You know what that is? You know what that religious overtone is? Normally we think of sin. When we think of sin, we think of God. That's who we think of when we know we're in sin. After all, it, isn't sin breaking God's law? It's breaking God's law. And if we break the law of God, do we not have to answer to God? For breaking his law. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin in man is twofold. Committing lawlessness and it's, is the spirit and nature of the devil in sinners. Whenever we sin, that's the nature of Satan himself. John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Those who follow the will of the devil are called the children of the wicked one. If we are living in habitual sin, we got to ask ourselves, who's our father? Who's truly our father? We don't want to do that, do we? We just want to think that, uh, you know, uh, once saved, always saved, in the church especially, we can do whatever we want now. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit, so we can do whatever we want. But if you're living in habitual sin and you're a professed Christian, a born-again Christian, 
Do you think God doesn't see that? Do you think he's just going to overlook that? Many people don't like to think of that possibility. Why? Because it's simply easier to talk about a failure than a sin. I dropped the ball. I failed. Another reason is that our culture calling a, a thing a sin is taking matters a little too far. What is true yesterday may not be true today or tomorrow. Think about that. Homosexuality. Several decades ago, you wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be able to talk in public about it. And today they promote it in our schools, our elementary schools, all the way up into our colleges. They're indoctrinated with it. They ask a group of teenage girls one time, do you think homosexuality is wrong? They say, no, we should be able to love anyone we want. They've been indoctrinated because moms and dads quit preaching the word of God in the homes too and warning their children. What does God think about it? And we need to preach the truth. What is true yesterday is not today because man wants to do away with God. You see, if you do away with God, truth and morality becomes what the current uh, culture is. It says that there is no absolute standard by which things should be judged. That's why they want to get rid of the Bible and they want to get rid of God in society. There's such a push in our world right now to get Bibles out of schools, out of motels, and that's worked in many cases, hasn't it? It's already there. We're watching it happen before our very eyes. They want God out of schools. They don't want prayer in schools. We watch that happen. They don't want it in society anywhere. People, even Christians, are afraid to say the word God in public today. And we shouldn't be. We should be as bold as lions. You're going to a restaurant, bow your head and pray to God and say his name out loud if you want. The Holy Spirit wants to reach a lost world. But we're not to be cowards. We're not to be fearful. We're to stand up in this hour that we live. But the world is trying to push us under to make us afraid to speak on sin, calling what it is. Sin is sin, and we need to speak it out. Therefore, to call faults and failures and mistakes and slip-ups sin is just too ridiculous in the world that we're living today. There's one problem with this kind of thinking. It's wrong. Amen. It's totally wrong. There is a God, and he takes sin quite seriously. God takes sin quite seriously. The Bible is clear when it calls sin a violation of God's law. It is also clear when it declares that we all committed sin. All. How many? All. Even if you only commit, think about this. Even if you only committed one sin a day for an average of your lifetime, do you know how many sins you would have committed if you do one a day in an average lifetime? You will have committed 70,000 sins if one a day. And most people do at least three or more a day. Now, if you go before a court of law with that kind of track record, do you think you're going to be in trouble? 70,000 sins? Well, Judge, I, I've only committed 70,000 sins in times whatever that is, if you do more than that a day, but every single day. Every single day, God takes sin very seriously. Jesus gives us powerful and radical evaluation of sin himself as you read the scriptures. There should be no doubt in your mind that he still takes sin seriously. God doesn't change his mind. Sin is sin. Jesus not only gets our attention, but should also cause us to be alarmed how casually we take sin. And in the church today, many places, it's casual. That's why we have many churches, especially the big ones, that, where the preacher only does a 20-minute sermonette now, never touches on anything that brings conviction to a heart. People think nothing of cursing, swearing, living in adultery, living in fornication, gambling, whatever. Think nothing of it. It's the same in the churches as in the world. We become like the world. We're in dangerous times, people. We've got to preach on this stuff and let the young people, as well as the older people, remind them that sin is sin, and God takes it seriously. Amen. He takes it very seriously. Do you take sin seriously, or do you sin seriously? Do you take 
sin seriously or do you sin seriously? We will do one or the other. But Jesus' message should be clear. We must deal seriously with sin because it's a very serious business. How you deal with sin should be extremely important to you because it, it can destroy you. Sin destroys. In fact, you may be sitting in here right now in this or you're watching by Facebook right now. You may be or being destroyed right now because of sin in your life. And you don't even realize it in some cases. But sin brings destruction. And there's some that are, in, are being destroyed right now through whatever type of sin that is. Look at homes that are going away. Drinking, drugs, adultery, fornication, all kinds of things going on within even Christian homes. And they're being destroyed. That's why divorce is so high even in the Christian home today. Because of sin. So how should we view sin? How should we deal with it in the life? You, you better make it, you better deal with your sin. If you have sin in your life right now, you're, again, you're watching by Facebook, you're in here. If you have any sin within your life, you better deal with it right now. Because if you don't, God will. You better deal with it, amen? amen. We better deal with it. As we examine further, we'll find that Jesus was radically clear in his prescription for dealing with sin. If you would take sin seriously, you must know the biblical definition of sin. Many Christians probably associate sin with the commission of various wrong deeds, which means we can take action to commit sin, whether in thought, word, or deed. It can be intentional or unintentional. And there's no doubt these are sins. Sins are violations of the law of God, but sin is more than that. Sin is that which is contrary to God. Sin is that which stands against God. Every time you and I sin, we are against God. And we need to think about these things if we're taking it casual, that we're coming against God himself. Some say that sins are symptoms of disease. You ever hear that one? It's a sin is a disease. I've heard a preacher preach on that. Sin is a disease. Just like they talk about drunkenness is a disease. It's not a disease. It causes diseases, but drunkenness is a sin. And even sin itself is not a disease. It's something we're all born with. It is the disease of sin that causes us to commit acts of sin. Wrong. Wrong. It is the heart that causes us to sin. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? <coughs> See, God's so much smarter than we are. He knows us inside and out. He knows these evil hearts. Even when we get born again, we still have to guard our hearts because we're born into a sinful world, and we are a sinner. People, we cannot even trust our own conscience, like I said earlier, because that can be seared. It's very unreliable sometimes. But Jesus made it clear in Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That adultery for instance, is committed in deed because of the desire of the heart. And we forget that God searches the heart. God searches our hearts. Even while you're, you and I are sitting here right now, watching by Facebook, God is searching our hearts right now. As I preach this, the best I can, the Holy Spirit is reading our hearts. What we're thinking, how we're even receiving it, or something else going on in our life. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And then verse 20, when you read it, it says, what does it do? These things defile a man. That's what sin does. It defiles us we got to be warned about it. Young people have to be warned about it. It's because our hearts are corrupt. 
and that's why we commit sin. The Bible teaches sin entered the human race through our original father and mother. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and by death, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all, for that all have sinned. How many sin? All. All of us. That's a big word, a little big word. All have sinned. If you ever listen to Ray Comfort or some of these guys who go street witnessing, and I've done that even myself in Chicago, in different places, you ask somebody, do you think you're a good person? Their first answer is said, well, yeah, I, I, I think I am. And then you take them through the process of witnessing and show them that they have evil hearts. Have you ever stole anything? Have you ever said a bad word? Have you ever thought desires about another woman or guy? Most time, they all, 100% of the time, they always say, yeah, but then you're a sinner. But they don't want to hear that. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, all of us. When Adam and uh, Eve, dis when they disobey God, the entire human race become corrupted because of that sin in the garden. We come into the world already corrupted. That cute little baby that comes into the world, that is so innocent came into a corrupt world, came into this world a sinner. And that's why we dedicate children in this church. We don't baptize them, we dedicate them, and when they get 12 years and older, we baptize them if they want. They need to come to repentance too. Romans 3.23 says, For all, how many? All. Have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How many are not righteous? None. None. God is telling us the truth. Everyone, I don't care if you're born again or not, you are not righteous in yourself. When I got born again, I become righteous in Christ. But I still got to work out my salvation, amen? You don't have to teach a child to be selfish, greedy, and angry, and revengeful, do you? You that raise children, you ever have to teach them how to be greedy? How to be mean? How to fight back? You ever have to teach them any of that? Get angry at you? You don't have to teach them any of that. You know why? Because they're born sinners. We all are. The Bible speaks of people have, who have not come to Christ as slaves to sin too. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them. Oh, here Jesus uses verily, verily. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever, who? Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Now that can be a Christian or a non-Christian because he said whosoever. God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't look past the Christian that sins. Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. If you are a born-again Christian, but you are practicing sin in your life, you are bound and you are a slave to sin. And 2 Peter 2.19 will confirm that also. Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield your ser yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. God put that in there. I didn't. If I'm living in any kind of sin, I am making myself a servant to sin. I'm a slave to it. That's why we strive to want to live for Christ. Amen. We want to live for him. We want to be like Jesus. And that should be our goal in our Christian life. Only Christ can free people of sin, of slavery. Only Jesus can do that. But even after being freed, we still have the capacity to sin. We can still willfully violate the will of God, the law of God. Whether as an unbeliever or a believer, we violate the law of God. Sin is still sin, and it is taken seriously by God. Very serious about it. Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're to work it out. 
not to get to heaven. We don't work our way to heaven, but we work out our salvation with the help of the Holy Spirit working within us, sanctifying us day by day, saying, God, forgive me. If you find yourself, you've sinned or fallen short in anything, you come before him in repentance and ask forgiveness. He says, I am just and faithful to forgive you of all your sin. That's a loving God, isn't it? And that's what we need to do as Christians too, not just overlook it and say, well, I sinned. No, we got to repent of it because God said right here, and why in fear and trembling? For those who are once saved, always saved. Why did God put fear and trembling in there if we have nothing to fear? Because God knows. God takes sin seriously, and it will destroy a Christian too. I've watched through my Christian life that I have grew in my Christian walk with guys my, at my age at that time that are no longer serving God. Some of them are already dead. That quit serving Jesus, and sin destroyed their life. I can't tell you where they are because I'm not the judge, but I can tell you what, I wouldn't want to have been where they are when they died, living the way they were. Let me ask you again, do you take sin seriously or do you sin seriously? We need to ask ourselves that. Time is short. Jesus might come. Our world can turn upside down. Why? There, there's a, I think there's a bill, somebody sent it to me in, in Congress right now, I can't remember the whole thing, but it, it's to come against the church to stop us from preaching the word of God. Wouldn't the devil love that? What I'm preaching right now will be against the law if that thing gets passed. Only if I'm saying, oh, you're all so wonderful. You're, you're all really great people. They'll let you preach that. Do you understand that to violate the law of God is to sin against his holiness? God's holy. That's why the angels say, holy, 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 day and night, nonstop for all eternity, because he's a holy, righteous, pure God, and he hates sin. Even what we call little white sins. There is no such thing as a little white sin. Sin is sin, and it will destroy, because a little one will lead to a bigger one, and that to a bigger, bigger one, to the point where your heart and your conscience are seared, and you don't even know it anymore. There's people that, how, how, have you ever talked to somebody that swears constantly, and you, and you tell them about it, and they say, well, I didn't even know I was doing that, because it becomes a habit. Swearing should not be a trait of a born-again believer. I, I had a bad mouth before I got saved. My wife's sitting here. She'll confirm that. But when God saved me, he radically saved me. The Holy Spirit would touch me, and I, would, I, I, I didn't want to hurt the Lord in any way for what he did for me on the cross. And I'm still that way. I'm not perfect. But when it comes to swearing, why do Christians do it? Why do they do it? Bible says old things are passed away. All things become new. He made us new creatures in him. You, would you stand in front of Jesus Christ and swear? You watching by Facebook, would you stand before the God of the universe, the one that's coming back, who will be the judge of the universe, and stand before him and arrogantly swear like you do today? Would you do that? I don't think so. Well, if you can't do it in front of him, why are you doing it right now? Because he's here. You're doing it in front of him. People who are using foul language, that's a sin. Do you understand that sin is not simply a mistake? It's a violation of divine righteousness. Do you understand that God calls sin evil? Since sin is contrary to his very nature, do you understand that God hates sin? Anything contrary to what is revealed in the Bible is sin. It's sin and it'll destroy us. Psalms 5, 4, and 6, For thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. God is absolutely holy. How many people think that living in habitual sin, that they are going to heaven and stand before a holy God? How do they think that? 
Why do they want to err on that side thinking, oh, God knows we're just human? Well, when he saved me, he put the Holy Spirit in me. And when I sin right now, I can run to him and say, Abba, Father, forgive me for I have sinned against you. Help me never to do it again. We need to walk in a state of repentance, people. We're in an hour that's dangerous in this world. And the devil is actively trying to destroy your homes, your children, and your own life through sin. That's why we are under attack like never before in this world. Verse 5, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest, that word hatest, when you look it up in the Hebrew, means enemy. We're an enemy of God. All workers of iniquity, thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. That means falsehoods. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. God is holy, 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 and righteous. Amen. Amen. The danger of sin. God hates sin because sin is hateful and it separates us from him. Isaiah 59, 2. But you, are iniquities, have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's what sin does. If you don't have answers to prayer, is there sin in your life? You need to ask. That's one area. Not all the time. Sometimes God's doing a work in us. But if you have sin in your life, could that be one reason God has not delivered you, healed you, helped you? Because he can't even hear you. That's just one example. There's other things in a whole other sermon. This is the only thing that separates us from God is sin. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, God put that in his holy word. He cannot or will not hear. When sin comes between him and man, and if he cannot hear, he's not going to answer, is he? If you don't hear anybody, you're not going to answer. If God tells us that the sin in my life separates me from him, that he cannot hear me, why am I talking to him? Until I repent and say, God, forgive me. Help me never to do that again. And he, he will. He'll forgive. He'll hear that cry. Sin corrupts. Sin destroys. And if you take sin seriously, you must comprehend the true danger of sin. Preacher, how is, how is uh, dangerous is sin? Well, according to Jesus, it's dangerous enough to cause a person to be thrown into hell. That's how dangerous it is. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and in Revelation 21, 8. That confirms it right there. Those types of things. Fornication. Adultery. The Bible says they shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, God said that. Now, if we think we can just cover it up and say, well, God will forgive me because... <laughs> uh -uh. God's word is his word. It's got to be under the blood. It's got to be repented of and turned from and walked away from, whatever that might be. If that is the consequence of sin, then sin is very dangerous, wouldn't you say? If sin can get me into hell, that's a dangerous thing to be wanting to live in sin. It causes us to be morally unrighteous and guilty before a holy God. That's what sin does. We will have to account for our violation of God's moral law. And the Bible teaches in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin. You work for a wage, you get paid. The Bible says when we live in sin... The wages is death, destruction. It'll destroy you. And we're watching homes being destroyed left and right. We're seeing people being destroyed left and right. I had a friend in Fargo, North Dakota that I brought up through the years here a couple of times that was on fire for Jesus Christ and he drank booze. It started out a little bit and pretty soon he started doing more and more and more to the point where he didn't even know he was having a problem anymore and he got killed in a car accident trying to outrun the police. I saw it on the news in Fargo, North Dakota. A good brother in Christ, we used to sit in fellowship together. But he didn't take sin seriously. He became a drunkard. 
and his life was short, cut short. That's what sin does. We think, eh, there's nothing wrong with that little, little cup of wine. Maybe it isn't for you, but how about somebody else in your family that can't control it? You maybe can, but maybe they can't. Sin affects the whole family. Adultery affects the whole family. That's why we have a bunch of children today thinking nothing about having sex outside of marriage because of compromise within the home. And it needs to be repented of because it's destroying hearts, it's destroying families, marriages, health in every area. Sin destroys. Amen. Amen. This death that God speaks of also as an eternal death. It's an eternal condemnation referred to as hell. Sin is deceptive, it is subtle, it perverts our very nature. We will lie to one another to try to cover it up if we have it in our own personal life. Sin left unchecked will destroy you from the inside out. That's what sin does. It's not the external many times, it's what's happening inside of here. Hearts become hardened and they become cold. God hates sin because sin destroys the very people he loves. This is one reason why God takes sin seriously. How about you? Do you take sin seriously or do you seriously sin? If you do not see the danger of sin, you will never take sin seriously. You never will. You'll even look at me and say, oh, that character is one of those hell brimfire preachers. Thank you. I receive it. Because I'm going to give the whole counsel. Let me say this to you today. If you take sin seriously, you must be committed to the destruction of sin within your life. You need to do whatever it takes to get it out of your life. And you need God to do that. You need the Holy Spirit to help you. You need the cross. You need the blood of Jesus. You need the name of Jesus. You need your armor on. Amen. It's got to be destroyed. It'll destroy you. And if not you, it can destroy somebody else. My heart goes out to many homes where children are gone astray because of families. Allowing sin in the home. Compromise. Thinking it's none of their business but their children are suffering the after effects. And many times children become just like the parent. And that's why we got to get sin out of the home. Shut the TV off. Shut the internet off. If you're watching things and hearing things you ought not be listening to. In other words, destroy sin in your life before it destroys you. It sounds extreme, doesn't it? It is extreme. It's an extreme message. Like cancer, sin is so vile and dangerous that we must go after it with a vengeance that needs to be cut out because it's going to spread. It starts out with a small thing. I heard of it one time my wife and I heard a testimony of a, of a pastor where his wife saw somebody in the congregation while she's up playing the piano. And she started thinking thoughts about this other man that she liked the looks of. And pretty soon that small seed, it kept growing and growing. And pretty soon, long story short, she left the preacher, divorced him, and married the guy. It started out with just a seed, just a thought. And God says, from the heart. That's why we got to address it. If we sense ourselves going that direction, we need to say, God, help me right now. I, I reject that thought in Jesus' name. Obey what God said. That's how we do it. Paul is teaching us in Romans how Christians can experience freedom from the control of sin. Romans 6, 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Okay? When Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead, the victory he achieved over sin and the death and the cross was imparted to you and to me. And to receive him as Lord and Savior, we get the victory. It says in Romans 6, 12, 13, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. 
He's telling us, don't let it rain. You and I, we're not to let it happen. God isn't going to, people say to me sometimes, Pastor, will you pray for God to take this from me? No. God's not going to take it from me. He already did it on the cross. He finished it. He said, you, you, you got the power now. The Holy Spirit in us gives us the power to say no to sin because of what was done on the cross. And when that Holy Spirit comes in, I can simply stand on the word of God and it may take a fight. It may be a bold fight, spiritual fight, according to the word of God, but you will have the victory. You'll have the victory. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as though that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. He gave us the power. No excuses when you stand before him. None whatsoever because he told us in his word he's given us the power. And he told us, don't let it rain in us. If you're allowing it in your life, it's because you're allowing it, not because the devil's making you do it. You and I are free will agents. And when Christ came in and dwelt in us, that's when sanctification begins. We do have a corrupt heart even after we get saved. But as those things try, the Satan tries to bring them back into our life. Now we have the Holy Spirit and we can come against Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Praise God. I do not have to be afraid of it because if there is something in my life, I can come against it in the name of Jesus Christ and I can rebuke it out of my life. If you need your life cleaned up this morning, if you're watching by Facebook, there's areas of your life you need to get right with God. You've got the power if you're a born born again Christian to overcome. It should be obvious that Jesus, while speaking in radical terms, was not simply prescribing the amputation of body parts when he said in Matthew 5, 29, 30, think of how serious sin is to the Lord. Listen to this. This is Jesus, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Now, obviously, he doesn't want us plucking our eyes out, but he's giving an example of how dangerous sin is and how serious it is. If it's making you sin, pluck it out. Cast it from you. Get rid of it. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. If that hand is a thieving hand and it steals, God said it's better for you to cut that hand off and cast it from you than to enter hmm, your whole body going into hell. Cut that hand off. That's how serious Jesus takes sin. It should be obvious that if you pulled out your right eye, you still have your right one left, or your left, or right. (laughs) If you cut off your right hand, you still have your left hand. Praise the Lord that he gave us two of each. Jesus was simply saying that sin is such a serious business that if the most precious thing you have causes you to sin, then get rid of it. Get rid of it. If you're watching by Facebook, if you have trouble with pornography, get rid of your computer. You don't need it. You can make it through life without a computer. If you've got dirty magazines in your house, get them out of there. Burn them. I went into a house one time. The guy had a stack of them that deep. He was struggling so hard in his life, and he said, I don't know what my problem is. He had pictures of Jesus all over his walls and stuff. I said, get rid of the idols, too. You don't need those either. I said, you need to burn this whole stack. Start doing it right now. Collect them. Burn them. Get them out of your home. They'll destroy you. And that's what was happening to this man. His life was being destroyed, and yet the very thing that was destroying him is what he was feeding on in in his home and what was hanging on his walls. And we need to face these things. It isn't fun to preach on this stuff. 
But it's a fact of life that if we don't warn one another, encourage one another, and help us wake up, we're going to have, this world is going to continue going the direction it is, and it is. Romans 13, 14, or yeah, chapter 13, verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You put Jesus on. You repent of your sins and you ask him to forgive you and you ask him to come into your life. He, he isn't going to do it unless you invite him. Unless you repent. Again, he says in Romans 8, 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. And we're watching that happen before our life. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify. You know what Paul used to do when he began to study the Word of God? Paul used to do this. He used to beat himself, literally, when he fought with whatever he was struggling with in Scripture. It says right here. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you got to beat yourself black and blue in the privacy of your home to get out of something, then beat yourself black and blue. That's better than cutting your hand off or plucking your eye out. But mortify that, mortify the flesh. Bring it under control. Don't let it control you because it can't if you don't want it to. According to the word of God, we must take whatever steps are necessary to, or to avoid sin in our life. That doesn't mean that we will be perfect. No one is. There's not a single person that will. But imperfection is not our standard or used for an excuse either. Our standard is to be like Christ. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. There you go. We're to walk like Jesus, aren't we? The old life is gone. The new one is here. We walk like Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you again. Do you take sin seriously? Or do you seriously sin? What are your pet sins? What are the sins that you find yourself committing over and over again? Walking in pride? Idol worship? Anger? Selfishness? Greed? Lying? Stealing? Lusting? Sexual sin? Gossiping? Backbiting or cheating? All of these could be on the list, couldn't they? I'm amazed at how many Christians will live in fornication and adultery and don't realize how seriously wrong they are and how it's going to destroy them eventually down the road. Be not yoked together with non-believer. But we have Christians going and living with non-Christians all the way from teens all the way up into the elderly in our world today. Why? Because the world accepts it. It's no longer a sin. But it is sin. God says it's sin. We got to avoid it. Homosexuality is sin. Lesbianism is sin. Gossiping is sin. Stealing is sin. Anything that's contrary to this word is sin. Some of you today need to deal with those sins before you do anything else. I'm speaking to Facebook, and even within our church body that we need to. The scriptural method for dealing with our sin is repent. We're to repent. We're to turn from it. That means we must confess our sins to God, commit ourselves to turn away from this sin. If you would take sin seriously, you must repent before God. You need to repent or you will be destroyed by it. Luke 13, 3, 5, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that ye were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall also perish. Think how seriously God takes that. If you are willing to repent, God will give you the power to forsake it. Amen? He will give you the power to avoid sin. He will give you the strength to restrain your desires and to avoid the flesh. Only he can empower you through this Holy Spirit to be able to be an overcomer of sin in our life. He gave us that power. We've got to get over this thing sitting in a bunch of group of people thinking we're all, we're all sinners, so God understands it's all going to mishmash together. No, God says repent or you're going to perish. 
If you're not a Christian, John 3, 3, Jesus answers, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Again in verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus said you needed to be born again. You need to repent of your sin. You need to come to him and ask for forgiveness. And he's just and faithful to do that. Believe in him. You may have prayed before. You may have joined the church and been baptized, but you have never accepted Christ and committed yourself completely to him, making him not only Savior, but Lord. Is he Lord? Is he Lord of everything you do? Do you glorify God in all that you say, all that you do, and how you live? If that describes you, then you're... Only hope for deliverance from the power and penalty of sin is to cast yourself completely upon the mercy of God. He owes you and me nothing. God owes us nothing. We deserve hell. We deserve hell. Every person does. Every person has ever been born and will be born deserves hell. But not God. He owes us nothing. He already paid the price. He is only the one who can deliver from the power of sin. 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to stop right up here, a couple more scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We got the victory. That's why we can stand up and say, praise God Amen. to a dying world. We got hope. I can walk up to a sinner and say, I've got hope. And you got to get ready to answer. If they say, well, how, what do you mean you got hope? You better be ready to answer, amen? Because they will do that. How can I have hope? We are in a hopeless world right now, and people are annihilating themselves, killing themselves, which is a sin, unless there's a mental issues going on and everything, and God knows that. But if they're purposely doing it because they're totally hopeless, somebody should have told them about Jesus. I'll finish with this. Real quick story, and I told it a long time ago, too. When I was in Chicago, I was at a convention, and I saw a guy that used to call on me. He was, I was a purchasing agent, and he was selling me product, and we talk about Jesus. And I hadn't seen the guy for a lot of years. He come walking down there, and he said to me, he looked downtrodden. I said, hey, man, what's going on? And he said, I said, how are you and Jesus getting along? He said, not very good. I said, what do you mean, not very good? He said, well, I'll tell you a story. And he went into his story and how a businessman invited him into his office and was sitting behind a desk. And he said to this friend of mine, the sales guy, he said, I heard you're a Christian. And he said, when that businessman said that to me, he said, I froze. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond to him. So I said nothing and just went on with business. And the next day, he got a phone call that that businessman killed himself. Sin. Sin. Christians ought to repent of sin and get rid of it before it destroys us. Our hearts can grow cold and hard where we don't care anymore. We got to keep them we got to keep them in the Word of God. We need the Holy Spirit to help us, to speak to us. And if we got sin in our life and you say it's hard, I don't know how to, then get in the Word of God and ask somebody you can trust that can come alongside and say, I'm going to pray with you. We're going to beat this thing and get it out of your life because it will destroy you. If you're watching by Facebook, you've got sin in your life. You're living in fornication. You're living with somebody outside of marriage. You better get out of that. It's going to destroy you. It'll only last for a moment of time. Sin is but for a moment, and then it's gone. If you're an adulteress and you're chasing other husbands or wives that you shouldn't be doing, you need to repent and get out of that thing quickly because it'll destroy you and others along with it. If there's any kind of sin in our life, whatever that sin is, no matter how small we think it is or how big it is, we need to repent. We need to repent. And this is the hour to do it, people, because what's coming on this earth is not going to be fun. And it's coming this way fast. And you and I need to be right in our life and we need to be clean of sin in order for the Holy Spirit to use us in the hour that we're entering. And it's coming quickly. Let's all stand, please. You notice I'm not a 20 
20-minute sermonette kind of guy. I couldn't have told all this in 20 minutes, could I? But I'm not an hour and a half either, like somebody said. That was not the truth. I've never preached for an hour and a half yet. Close, but never. But I'm always going to tell you the truth. And with every head bowed and eye closed, we're going to... I just, I'm going to do this because I, I don't know everybody here, and I think it's important. Jesus, you, you heard my message. You heard about sin. Is there anybody who said, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ? I've never asked him to forgive me and be Lord of my life. I've never put my trust in him. I've been trusting in myself. If that's you, you're going to miss heaven. Jesus said that we need to repent. We need to come to him. And I ask that the Holy Spirit will speak to any heart's if there's anyone, and this, this is really hard, isn't it, when, you, when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us. And I, I'd like every eye closed. If you're watching by Facebook right now, sin has been dominant in the church as well as in the world. And it needs to be repented of because we're entering a time where God is going to be doing a great work in the lives of those who are totally committed to him. And he knows every one of us deal with something, but he also told us that he will give us the strength. And he will give us the ability to walk out of whatever is controlling our lives. And I would say, is there anybody in here that's saying, Pastor, there's areas of my life that I really need that Lord's help. Just raise your hand up and be honest with the Holy Spirit. Don't look, don't look around. My hand's already up. I need help. Look at here. I, I, I don't care what you think of me, but I need help in areas of my life. There's areas of your life you know that you need help in and you need to bring it under control. Maybe it's something gossip, or maybe it's a, even being a respecter of person. Jesus said you've sinned if you have respect of persons. If you have sin in your life, put that hand up, man, woman, child. You need to get right with Jesus. Say, Lord, forgive me. And I'm just going to ask real quick, all of us sit with our hands up. You want to come down here with me with my hand up. Stand with me. Let's do it together as a family and let the Lord know we're serious. And you are watching by Facebook if you're watching. You need to get on your knees wherever you're at right now. Thank you for coming up. We need to do this. If you're ashamed of God before man, he'll be ashamed of you. You need to do what God's called you to do. And sin is important. It's a serious business that God hates, and he wants us, the church. That's why God says in Chronicles, if my people which are called by na my name will repent and turn from their wicked ways. There he is, and what you're doing right now, you're saying to God, I take that seriously. I need to turn from my wicked way. Maybe I think I'm so good I don't need to do it. Then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Just move up closer. I'll step back so I don't spit on you. Just move in, people. This, we're not going to take long, but I want to pray with us as the family of God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. It's you and I, the church. The church has been sick. And you that are staying back, if you are saying, I, I, I'm, I'm working on things, I'm right with God and everything, then put your hand forward and let's pray right now for these people that come forward. Because I'm up here too. Point them at me. It can be anger, it can be thought, it can be deed, whatever. We need to repent before it's too late. Heavenly Father, say it with me, people. My prayer, you don't have to agree with my prayer, but you say it in agreement that we're all saying this together right now. Before God, before his throne, he hears right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I need your help. I've got issues in my life. I've got some sin in my life. And I need help to walk out of it, to away from it. Holy Spirit, convict my heart and help me to turn from anything that separates me from you. And I ask Jesus to forgive me of everything in my life that is contrary to you. And when I find myself sinning, 
help me quickly to stop in the name of Jesus and to come to you and say, Jesus, forgive me for what I said, for what I did right now. And if you mean that, if you mean that people right now, God will do that. He will forgive you instantly. But if you're doing it to play games with him, he knows your heart. But if you seriously want to be a, a, a Christian living for Jesus Christ, then you mean that in your heart and God will do a supernatural work in you and I today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus as brothers and sisters in Christ. We stand before you in unity right now. We agree, Lord, we need you. We need forgiveness. We need help. Lord, we are attacked within our minds and our thoughts against sinning, against you and family, whomever else. But Lord, we come before you. We ask through the power that you've given us through the Holy Spirit to come and begin to manifest within our lives. Help us to begin to clean our house out, clean our minds out, Lord, of things that ought not be there. Father. Help us to quit doing the things that we've been making excuses for that we know are very destructive in our life and instructive in other people's lives. Help us to take it seriously, Lord, that we want our home, we want our house, we want our lives clean from sin in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that right now. Pour out your spirit upon the people here, their homes and their families right now. Those watching by Facebook, Lord, those I can sense right now, Father, there's some people that are before their television or their internet right now bowing and saying, God, forgive me. Help me to renounce it. Get sin out of my life. Help me to shut off, turn away, walk from anything that will bring sin into my life, into my heart, into my mind. Help me to read my word, uh, read your word, Lord, daily. And help me to talk to you daily, Lord. And help me to walk in a spirit of repentance when I find myself saying or doing or thinking things I ought not. Help me to say, Lord, forgive me and to turn from. And Lord, I know you hear these prayers because you said you not only hear them, you answer them. And so Lord, we right now just surrender to you and repent as a church. Repent as a nation before you, Father. Our little church, amongst many other churches, remnant churches, are doing the same thing today around this nation. Lord, we want you. We need you in this hour, Lord. And we praise you, we thank you, we glorify you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 The Lord bless you and, and, the, and, and we're going to make it. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. And we are warriors. We are soldiers for the cross. We will be as bold as lions when we leave these walls. If we walk out those doors, we will witness the th things of Jesus. Should somebody ask, we will pray in the restaurants. We will begin to be what God's called us to be and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but go forward as a mighty army in a dark world because I know who wins. I read the last chapter and I'm serving the commander in chief right to the very end with his help amen lord bless shake somebody's hand on the way out if you don't know him meet him say hi what's your name this is my name i love you even though you don't know me